Uh, good morning, Maranya Yadia. Nipalado, Raji, Nyemba, Yena. Welcome. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people here. And um, it's, it's pretty amazing when I actually looked at all your backgrounds. And uh, it's really such a pleasure and a wealth of experience and also activism, advocacy, music. I just heard that a moment ago. Ronnie was practicing. That's very good. And so really impressed on that. And, and a lot of areas that we really relate to. I'm not going to stick to the questions uh, a lot because I think that we've got a, a pretty astute audience. I think you have been also sharing a lot of the issues and understandings of knowledge and uh, what it is to be not only uh, from a Pacific nation, but uh, from us here, we uh, see ourselves as unceded sovereign people. So that's really important and that's why we relate to each other because we are unceded sovereign people and we don't need a piece of paper to prove it. So that's the best part. Um, I, I think that the background for me is that I came to academia, I was sharing with Katerina the other day. Uh, I had uh, four children and um, two of them actually were born during my music contract money. So I was at dress rehearsals after one of them was born on the Friday, went back and work on Monday. So yeah, a bit crazy. <laughs> But um, I really, really um, you know, enjoyed the opportunity to come to university, but it was really frightening in some regards. Um, also, um, you never saw an Indigenous uh, lecturer, and uh, especially about issues to do with um, our, our people. So I think that um, it, it's also been a learning curve. So um, after that, uh, I think that you know today is really to share ideas and thoughts, and we welcome or uh, in the Q and A for your session to ask really solid questions because you know that's what it's about is sharing. And uh, after coming back from a couple of cops, you know you feel like you're a bit isolated, and sometimes you have those great opportunities to share and whatnot in foreign countries. Uh, but you know the bottom line is that this is. Uh, really what it's all about is, is us getting together and sharing. So what I'd like to start with is, you know, when we talk about self-determination, and we were talking just before we started, it can be a pretty generic uh, discussion sometimes if you just don't add all of the other areas of the articles of uh, UNDRIP, for example, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, and also our, our own protocols, our own local protocols. You know, they're the steering of our lives and the laws and the customs and practices. So those are important. And, and what I've seen over many years after uh, studying human rights, um, practicing in that area, and, um, and I started off as a criminal defense lawyer, so I've seen the, the, the really rough end of the justice system as well. So I think that it's really important to see these issues, um, particularly on how it's going to support your um, advocacy and also uh, where you want to be and your goals and your, and your understanding that the system is often broken um, when we talk about self-determination. Uh, but, you know, with sovereignty too, you know, we see some examples in, um, uh, for Indigenous people in Australia, we have always uh, looked towards Canada, uh, you know, Section 35 and their uh, Aboriginal recognition of, of um, its people and its uh, laws and customs. Uh, so we're going through that same issue, uh, whereas where do Aboriginal people sit in constitutional recognition? Uh, when constitutional recognition in this country was founded, it was in 1901, uh, most of uh, the, the founding fathers um, uh, didn't include women, uh, so women weren't to vote. Um, indigenous people weren't even thought of as human here at that time, so we certainly weren't asked to vote. And uh, it was really seen as a predominantly uh, white male having much property and then having the opportunity to vote. So in that background, we're actually having a refresh this year uh, where we're going to go to a referendum for all of Australians to vote. And it's really interesting because, you know, as we do, all of our communities see different opinions and understandings of what that voice is. And that's quite right because we all have the right to have our own view and informed uh, position. So this is a very important part of 
our understanding and also where we're heading this year with that referendum, which will uh, recognise uh, <coughs> Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but also provide an advisory group department. So any of you that have been on an advisory group, it's not a scary issue um, when you're actually putting together a group to inform uh, the parliament on laws and regulation uh, that's proposed that's going to affect Indigenous people. So that seems pretty common sense. So that's where we're at. And I just wanted to share that to start with because I think um, there's going to be some examples of understanding sovereignty issues and certainly self-determination issues and, and how they reflect because we have a wealth of information here and advocacy and activism. We have education, we have music and activism and, and West Papua um, is, is certainly always strong in our hearts and minds because freedom is a powerful word and uh, in music it's even more powerful as I know. Uh, and also, I think from your TEDx um, sp uh, speech, and uh, that was really powerful from Suva. And I I'd like to also, you know, really touch on some of those issues that you're actually um, dealing with today, and also with you, George, because Hawaii um, hasn't ceded their sovereignty, and uh, there's been a, a great movement across Hawaii, and I've been going for a number of years, um, and just seeing the momentum grow. And, and the, the building of language, the Kamehameha schools, um, you know, pride in your culture and heritage, you know, those things that we understand are so strong for our people. So I just wanted to hand it over to uh, you um, to start off, Linda, and on what you see as sovereignty, what you see and understand as self-determination, and, and how that equates to where you started <coughs> and where you're at now and where you want to be especially in the future. Mm. Okay. It's a pretty simple question to answer, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a simple question. <laughs> um, okay, so, well, I guess how I understand sovereignty, uh, sovereignty and, and oh, sorry, by the way, I'm Melinda Mann, I'm a uh, Durable Aboriginal woman from Central Queensland um, and uh, South, Australian South Carolina. Um, so, um, I speak today as kind of, you know, you, uh, enacting my sovereignty and being completely 100% both Aboriginal and South Um So the way that I have come to understand sovereignty and know what sovereignty is, is um, through, you know, the, the stories and the understandings and definitions that my, fa my father and my mother taught me. And um, so definitely not within the you know, kind of a legal framework, um, but that does play into how we understand uh, the way that uh, um, you know make make sense of what happens to our people uh, in this continent, this colony in Australia. Um, so you know, sovereignty for us um, is our inherent rights that come from the land, and our land being um, as we know it. You know, holds our our laws and our knowledge and our language, our songs, our dance. Uh, our, our land is our ancestor. And someone said that yesterday in one you know, brilliant session you were in the afternoon. Um, and so I've always have known sovereignty to be like a, a personality trait and a characteristic of ancestors. And so, as a person from a you know, from Dharma country. We have we are one of the seven traditional owners of the Great Barrier Reef, and so for us, our sovereignty is not just our land but our sea country. Um, and so, you know, the way that we understand the ocean from our point of view is the, the land is our, our sea country, which is which covers about thirty six thousand square kilometres. Um, you know, that is the place where our ancestors. Um, are buried because before the ocean came in and the reefs grew about 9,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, um, that was the land that we occupied. Um, so our sovereignty is the sea floor as well as the land that we live on now. And, you know, I think that um, the politics of sovereignty can help, or, you know, it helps the colony, it helps 
the, these constructions of of place now to move us further away from who we are as Indigenous people. Um, I think that we have to hold on to our Indigenous ways of understanding uh, who we come from, where we come from. Um, that's the basis of our sovereignty. Our sovereignty is um, the thing that holds us close and it makes us familiar to our ancestors. Um, I think that the things, we have to be very careful in talking about you know, these you know, constitutional recognition and other things that we might, that I think um, makes us, or it has the danger, has the risk of making us unfamiliar to our ancestors. Um, yeah, I don't know, not waffle on, I just want to hear from others as well. Can I also ask you, just before we do go on, you, you talk, you talk it, uh, about um, uh, the strength of ancestral connection, and you've written about seabed mining. And uh, um, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, uh, education. And so this is what we were talking about. Is education is also very strong because when we talk about the transfer of, of knowledge, traditional knowledge, um, how how does that really equate to a Western education? Because you know, young ones start from primary and they've got all these different concepts. They've got these concepts through high school and then you're trying to actually find yourself in your identity. So, so how does it actually equate to then a, a, a cultural education? How do we actually get sovereignty happening in that space? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I'm not too sure what everyone else's education system is like, but Australia's is south. Uh, Thank you. I think where I see my kids demonstrate sovereignty mm -hmm. is walking out of classrooms, um, getting suspensions, like those kinds of things, for doing things that are just um, things that are often interpreted as, um, you know, being delinquent, um, you know, being whatever, uh, all of the words that they like to use. But I think, um, you know, there's there's a lot of the Australian education system historically has been used as a weapon to dis, uh, you know, dismantle uh, Aboriginal families and societies. And it still is that. That is the purpose of this education system here. And so we, const we are constantly fighting as both, you know, as Indigenous people, as Indigenous parents, um, back on a system that is not, has never been designed to help us, but has actually been designed to break our culture down to be nothing, to disappear our culture from um, our children. So, you know, we still turn up every day with our children, just like all the old people did when the schools first started, um, to help our children get an education. Um, but we know that we have to give them the tools to navigate a very violent um, white space that, that teaches them that, you know, a whole heap of things, but one being um, uh, that the, the justification of their, but the, the invasion um, requires them to, you know, go to school and to be assimilated. So I think that, um, you know, there are ways that we can try to uh, protect our children from that kind of thing, but, uh, you know, with black schools, with indigenous schools and with, um, but we have to unteach, un unlearn our children from that kind of stuff constantly. Um, so it is, you know, we, we give with, they give with one hand to take with the other. So, you know, we have to constantly be feeding back into our children, um, you know, validating them, giving them the, the information that they need to be able to just go to school on top of dealing with lots of other stuff that happens in our, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait communities um, that they have to take to school, and you know, I think of I think of children who have, are constantly in grief because of um, you know whether it's deaths in custody or other types of you know ways that Aboriginal people, Torres Strait Islander people, are neglected and and um, and die from that kind of neglect, and now we expect our children to be at school every single day, um, and just things like that that constantly work against Aboriginal people being able to be human. That's right, well said. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. And I think the insights, I, th I, was, I was going to go to Warren, but I think, Joy, I think the connection with exactly what Havahi had the same stolen kingdom and experience uh, of actually having a, an amazing 
um, monarchy, a very strong monarchy who really did think about how um, it could raise the uh, level of lifestyle and also culture to remain culturally strong. So how is it today when we still have that same issue of sovereignty and trying to really keep strong and get the outcomes that you've been wanting for the past, what, how many years? Uh, 150. There you go. Going on 200. Yeah. So, so <laughs> how is it that um, we're in this place together with this sovereignty and self-determination discussion, but what are the issues that you're still facing and that really haven't moved much? <laughs> You this the really easy questions first thing in the morning. Let's describe it. my co 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 for those of you who don't know this, Hawaii is part of the Pacific. We are illegally occupied by the United States since 1893. We are a fake state. And I say that because they did some trickery and did a joint resolution and not an actual annexation. So we have been militarily, and I want to say this very clearly, we are militarily occupied by the United States. So what is our issue today that remains the same issue? Capitalism, capitalist interest, mono, you know, monopoly capitalists, and the US military to back it. We are the buffer zone for the United States in the Pacific. We are also the head of the so-called Indo-Pacific fleet. Now, what people don't understand about Hawaii is that it is so crucial to the United States because their little navy boats can't make it to Guam or the Philippines or to any other part of the Pacific unless they stop at our islands for fuel. The US, the Department of Defense uses eight billion gallons of fuel annually. So when they poison our waters for the sake of jet fuel It's because they're the largest energy drivers on the planet. I don't know if I, I'm sorry I'm not very strong for your question, but I mean, we've got to wake up. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking out and we're sleeping. We can't be sleeping right now. You know, Hawaii, unfortunately, is and my, I'm looking at Guam too, because we're occupied by the United States and uh, we're, we're often written off by the Pacific as America and we forget about the Chamorros and we forget about the Kanaka Maoli and sometimes the Kanaka Maoli forget about the rest of the Pacific except for my Maoli friends over there. <laughs> Maybe a few Tahitians. <laughs> and this is the work of 40 years of neoliberalism. Because you remember, we used to be regionally connected. We fought hard. We backed up Micronesians. We, backed, we were there for nuclear fights. We were looking at the fights for independence in Melanesia. We were connected globally to black power. Hawaii was part of, as it has always been, Hawaii, when, when, when Cook got lost and found us, and, um, and luckily we took care of them the next year, but like, when Cook got, when, when, um, when, when the Americans came, the planters came, when the sailors came, when the whalers came, they came to a place that was very developed, very advanced, and they wrote about it. They were so shocked. And we, we're very much in the global trade. Kamehameha, when he did that, what we'll call unification of the islands, I'll call it a little slight, small kind of imperialism, but you know, when he did that, he was putting tariffs on the harbors because when he went to China with sandalwood, yet yeah, he bought foreign boats, he went to China, he was trading in sandalwood in 1800, 
He, came, he found out there was tariffs on their harbors. You know what he did? He came back and put tariffs on European, on European on the harbor. We knew the harbor was well. That's why he moved the kingdom there. All of this knowledge, we were always lockstep in contemporary times. It was not until the overthrow, eugenics, and the very hard work of, try, of trying to prevent us from speaking our language, from cutting us from our culture to, to assimilate us into an Americanism, that we suddenly became backward, savage, primitive, and that's the language that they trotted out when we were fighting for Mauna Kea. That's the language they trot out. And it's not so much Kamehameha schools that was bringing back the language, but the charter schools and other folks that it is the work outside sometimes of our large institutions that is bringing and holding on to those languages. But it's more than just the culture that we need to be talking about. We were just talking about critique yesterday. At what point, right, do we start really talking about organizing? political economy, and take ourselves seriously around governance. When do we do that, if not now? We're in a rising fascist state. Diplomacy has failed us in many ways. The old ways simply are not enough. So when we talk about the next generation, it requires actual training. It requires actual codification. It requires, it requires us as adults to be committed to the or to the developing and organizing and accountability of the next generation in ways that make sense, not in romantic ways. When I talk about sovereignty, I am not romantic because I think about what's going to happen after. Let's just say the U.S. leaves tomorrow which is, you know, I dream this daily. <laughs> um, when the U.S. leaves, this is a country that would poison our, that would, that would just leave us our brown fields, you know, make sure the jet fuel leaks into the water, just to spoil us. Then, <coughs> sorry, you all know, I'm getting over cold. So, you know, America was making gag. Anyway, um, <laughs> so we need to do the work of reconnecting, of taking, if there's no NFIP now, what is the next formation? Those are the conversations we need to have. We need to start really taking the next century seriously. It is not about performing at different spaces. It is about us seriously, actively organizing and building power. How do you build power, right? It begins with these relationships. It begins with being a, right? We have nothing without our relationships to each other. And in those relationships, we forge something that cannot break. So that's, that's my next phase. Is, by the way, in 2024, I'm hosting a little summit up in Hawaii, we can talk about it later, to talk about these things, All right? Um, Anyway, I don't know if that started off your question. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and more. <laughs> well said. Well, I think that the refreshing uh, part of this conversation is that we have uh, an incredible activist and musician in Ronnie as well as many other talents. I, mean, I was reading and watching things about you last night and, and the day before. So can we uh, have you um, introduce yourself and, and talk about these discussions that we're having now? Thanks, My guy, I, wah, 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 wah. It's greetings from 
Papua across different languages, over 325 languages, <coughs> just on the western half to Papua New Guinea. Was Papua the nation in waiting? And I born on, in Papua New Guinea as a refugee. And growing up there in PNG, it also kind of questions my identity. Because um, at home, my parents will speak Bahasa. And then when I'm out of France, it's Tokisin. But then the cultural practice grounded me to understand the kinship. And this is where with this conversation around sovereignty. And that is something that resonates with me when we have that strong connection with the families and knowing your name is deeply rooted with the land that you come from. Then that's it. That's that's your sovereign right there. And that was me growing up, understanding that through songs and dance and music. And so there was a big group of, or influx of the refugees in the early 80s and part of the big group uh, were the members of the Mambesa string Lane group. And in the early 60s to 70s, the peasant who went around to collect songs, uh, Anola, uh, he's a musicologist and anthropologist. He went and he, at the time, with the situation that was happening in West Papua, he collected and archived songs in different languages. And by doing so, he became the target. But what he did is preserving and protecting those uh, songs and the language. For the generation like myself, growing up in Papua New Guinea, didn't know uh, the connection to the land, but because of my family name, I know I can identify to that and the stories that been told through the dance and the songs really grounded me and really makes me aware when I even come here um, as a student to Australia, I realized that yeah, it plays that big part as a uh, Papuan identity in a multicultural society but also understanding the struggles, the sovereignty struggles of the First Nations people here. Um, and it's connected where the colonization uh, and the capitalism, how it has really sets those uh, pretexts to really exploit the land and the indigenous people of different places. And that also uh, a real, real awakening as well. And connecting with the all the different ten embassies, the uh, Aboriginal ten embassies here in Australia. Um, firstly, with the the Canberra one here, it's one of the longest protest sites in the world. And that it's not just a symbolic, but it's in practice where the sovereignty or sovereign rights of the indigenous people people can see that exists today. And that makes me also proud that yes, to connect with that. And many of the elders, like Uncle Kevin Basakot, he is a firekeeper of some of the uh, the, and the, uh, the ten embassies, and Robert Thorpe, and then getting to know and hear that really helps in terms of uh, the the connection of our struggles, and that makes me proud as well as we realize that now in these spaces and just hearing from you, the land is our ancestors. It just reinforcing that or like just another um, uh, confirmation that yes, it is critically important. And the issues that the Sister Joy just highlighted as well, very powerfully in saying that. Uh, and with the West Papua case as well, um, we know that the human rights situation and the national liberation struggle is still there. But the question around when we talk about sovereignty, whose sovereignty are we talking? Is it from the legal framework or Western concept and definition of the uh, Montevideo Convention of 1933? Uh, sovereignty, or are we really talking about the sovereign people, where it comes through their family name, where it comes through their connection with the land, knowing our uh, connection with the, when the, 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 the totem, 
Um, like myself, I know um, that my totem is turtle, and I'm proud of that. And that's the story that comes through my uh, dad and coming down to me. So that's sovereignty there. We're exercising that. And the other thing that I also wanted to highlight as well, in using music as a weapon of choice. One of my elders always reminded me um, the role of uh, missionary that came. On one hand, they, will, they told us that, oh, you guys have to close your eyes and pray and hold the Bible. But on the other hand, they said, drop your kundu, or the kundu is the drum in Topisi, or tifa in Bahasa. And that, that's it when, you, when they finish the prayer, amen, then now, you don't play the kundu anymore. Even looking at now, a lot of the younger, like, younger generation like myself, um, not a lot of the young people are uh, confident to hold the kundu or the garamu, the pate, to play with that pride in them. And that's because of this, yeah, how those three Gs that, that came around and then you drop all of them. But I'm proud that through the music, I can continue to practice them. And kundu is my message. The sounds that are played in those uh, drum, it speaks of the, the kinship, the song lines that co connects each other. Um, for example, like from the top, um, the island where I come from, Yapen, there is a certain rhythm that I can hear, and then when you travel the sound, as it travels down to the south in Narauke, it changes. And then when you travel across to Torres Strait, it changes as well, and then you go to the, to, uh, across to Papua New Guinea, and then to Kanaki, the Kanak music. And so it's all about that sound. If a, a, a songman or a Tifa um, player hear the sounds, they know exactly how that travels, the song line travels. And that is where uh, my role here as a, as a voice of my people to continue and to strengthen that, but also understanding that it's not gonna be as performative for everyone, but there are certain uh, things that we play stays in the ceremony where it's meant to be stayed there rather than it's out there to just enter them, unless it's being blessed and by the elders that, okay, you can play. So in our band that we toured, Sorong Samurai, Sorong is the western end of the island in, in Papua, and Samurai is east, and it's also reframing the island. And so our musicians, when we came together, we just decided to use the two different towns, Sorong to Samurai, and use that as a band name, but also as a movement to reframe the arbitrary line that separates the people and the land. And you see that as a weapon of choice. And the song speaks about the struggle um, and the struggle that is in the songs and in the dance. And that's what I am proud of, to really continue to um, build the capacity of the young people that I work with in Papua, but also at the same time, the strengthening the, uh, the capacity of those who are on the ground to really organize, mobilize, and given that the isolation of West Papua, particularly with the foreign media blackout, and as well as the investi investigative reporting of the internally displaced Papuans that are surviving, using indigenous knowledge to survive in the, the, the periods where the escalation of the military operations and the de-escalation, and how they survive in the jungle. And since 2018 till present day, the indigenous, it's been estimated through the Papua Council of Churches that 60,000 internally displaced persons. Now, if this is somewhere in another part of the world, this would have really um, created all uh, media head headlines or humanitarian responses. But until now, there hasn't been any of that. And so this is about like also how do we support the young ones or Papuans to be really taking those um, training and education to be the media citizen on um, documenting all of this. And there'll be more conversation of this later with the other colleagues. But in terms of um, what I do, uh, music plays a big part as well, or in the arts. And it's important as well uh, when we touch on this topic, 
um, the arts community plays a big part um, in um, in our culture as orat oratory culture, where it's through the songs and dance. It's not written, so the song kid, song man or the drum player, they're the historian in our in our practice, and they are play a critical role in in the exercise of what sovereignty means for indigenous people. Thanks. Thanks so much. That, Ronnie, I, I think a lot of people will be speechless now because that's just so powerful. And it speaks to solidarity, it speaks to the messages that you've been talking about as well, George, um, is organisation, and, and also there is such a strong purpose and Melinda, you were saying the same thing about young people, you know, giving them uh, the ability to, to know who they are and the strength in who they are, and to know the, the, the real story behind our peoples and, and, and the struggles and the resilience that we all have, even in this audience, um, just maximise the opportunities of that strength, which is, is just amazing when you hear these, these experiences. So thanks so much, Ronnie. Um, Maureen. <laughs> I come from uh, Fiji, somewhere, as in the big S, somewhere. Um, and I was really thinking about this question uh, quite deeply because I think we, as Joy says, we need to wake up. The notions and understanding about sovereignty today is wide open to occupy. Mm. And it's wide open to occupy, specifically because a country like Fiji is sovereign, but are we really sovereign? When your debt level sits at maybe 90% of your GDP, how sovereign are you? How much control do you exercise as a country over your resources and territories? Do you have sovereign control? So I want to look at the question through the big S. Sovereign, and sovereign states, and more specifically, the acts of sovereign, uh, which is the small, as which I think is where much of resistance actually lies. Um, and I want to start by really to say that our notions of sovereignty, particularly in the context of climate change, is shifting the boundaries. Now, there are many lawyers sitting here and you know precisely what I mean. The sovereign state, for the first time in history, is about to disappear within the context of an environmental disaster, which is climate change. What happens, what does that mean? What does that mean when a country like Tuvalu, in recognizing that this is about to take place, takes a sovereign country and puts it in the matter verse. Matter to them. What does the notion of sovereignty mean? Who holds all of that? The matter, all the stories, the knowledge, genealogy gets uploaded to the matter. We are in an open space and field to occupy sovereignty. And I say this really, really particular because we are thoroughly colonized. Everything that we know and can see from land right down to the deepest part of the ocean is thoroughly colonized. Even the things that we cannot see, the microscopic things is now owned by and is determined through this lens of soul. Think about it, how thoroughly territories, air, land, oceans, to the smallest genetic coding is contested under this idea of soul. So lawyers, specific lawyers get to work we have so much to do to recover. Mm. Data, some really do of data, the biggest commodity that is being fought on and shaped right now. Where are we in this discussion? In addition to this enduring legacy, 
But I want to start with a problematic, contentious argument about how thoroughly colonized we are. Mm. Everywhere we look. And not just about governments. The power of transnational cooperation mm. is phenomenal in this who owns and the, the questions of sovereignty. So the challenge to the Pacific walls. We are in open field and open territory right now. We need to get to work around the big guys. But much of my work really, really rests on, and I want to really start with this, the protocols and rituals that are embedded in this country. And this word, unceded. For me, it is the most powerful word and an act. Mm particularly for people like us who are not sovereign. Because we, we, people like us, we have ceded too much. Mm -hmm. And learning to unseed ourselves, even from our governments and our government structures, is hypocritical today. This word, unceded, remains true. And I think we need to be looking for all of those stories and rituals and protocols with people consistently demonstrate what it means to be unseated. Mm. And it's happening right across, even in sovereign territories. I want to bring up two cases, and I think these are where the stories really matter, about people who do not see to modern construction or modern state construction mm. of sovereignty. Right? So yesterday, Nick McClellan in um, the ocean uh, plenary talked about Vanuatu and New Caledonia and the contest over uh, Russell Hunter uh, using custom, custom stories, some mm. to resolve questions of territory. That's an unceded action. <laughs> that doesn't recognize France as Kings, nor Fiji's implication to that particular dispute. It simply went ahead in an act of making proclamation that this belongs to the people of the world. It is resolved by people who do not recognize and cede authority and power to either France or the government of age. That's, that's a story that is worth remembering in our struggle today. Mm -hmm. The other one is flagged by Julian in his statement around Wake Island. Mm -hmm. The US claimed it <laughs> using precisely the laws that Ronnie talked about, which is to claim territories. That act is an unceded act. It simply goes back. So when I spoke to some of the negotiators, they said, look, we were taught by the brightest people, the US, of course. But the same rules they used to go back and reclaim wake through some lines, traditional and custom, custom practice. So I think in this question of, of, of a really difficult one, because we are one of the regions where we still have colonial territories, and we should name them as such. But I think that's, that's where we need to really stress it. We have to wake up. We are thoroughly colonized as a region. We need to occupy the questions of sovereignty. And what does it mean today? What does it mean for our future? But we are in a space where we have to occupy and resist. Our people are doing it. When I see the recovery of trading routes, the resistance that they're doing, they are, are simply not ceded. They haven't ceded. We policymakers and us in the development of perhaps we have ceded. Perhaps we and need to go back and relearn again. But our people are already demonstrating very sovereign acts outside of modern state constructions that I think we should we look at to give us the language and the ways to do that. 
and let the lawyers catch up and reorganize the legal norms and systems to respect. When we say in our constitution that our people are the owners of territories, that's the act that they're doing. That's what we give them. That's what we've given them. So I just want to just use that to prop just think about this open field right now that we need to occupy in specific islanders and the actions of the small star that is each day reaffirming that we have never seen and perhaps unlearn a lot of the things that we learn as sovereign people. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, the strength in, in uh, this shared conversation is, is really precious. And I just before I break into Q and A, I just want to see if there's any other thoughts that we could provide, um, just to spur these ideas, questions, and also let that when we walk out of this in, in incredible place with this incredible conversation, that we then think more deeply about the responses that you've given today. So, is there anyone that would like to actually add anything before I hand it over to Q and A? Right. All right, I'll hand it over to the audience. Uh, any questions that you have? Uh, we'd love to hear them, even if it's not on topic. Uh, I think we'd uh, certainly appreciate that discussion. Thank you. No need to be shy, that's what you're here for. Power, knowledge, sharing. Thank you. We've just got a mic coming to you right now. I, I don't need a microphone. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So aloha kako. Uh, I just want to ask a question to Joy. Aloha. And I wanted to fuse into how do you use your art, your visual art, to transmit the messages that you're trying to to bring forth? So you, you come in really powerful. And I know you're also a visual artist. So. I'd love to also hear about the song lines, you know, the way that we can actually really use and generate the arts to, mm. to be a form of activism, to, to mobilize. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Actually, we're gonna be talking about this after lunch with Yuki, but um, the, I'm a little different artist. Politics comes before my art. It is, it is the soul and center of my art. Art is in, in, in relationship to movement. It is used to help move people towards liberation. If you look around the world, art is used in liberation and revolutionary struggle. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we think culture is enough and, and, and being able to um, you know, just do a poem here and there, big things, is enough to say we're being political. I disagree. My things, the work that I do, I do research for my work. I think about what's happening in the world and how does that relate. So when climate change came, right? When climate change, we've been talking about climate change since 1970, by the way, but um, anyway. Uh, I'm like, how can my artwork, um, and this is in a very selfish way, obviously I'm talking in an individual way right now, be in service to the Pacific, right? It's not in service to me. I'm, I'm personally, I'm trying to figure out a problem, right? I'm trying to make art and it's helping me to navigate a very huge problem. But then the work has to do something else. I don't come from this art to arts. I don't, no, I'm not part of it. That's some Western nonsense. The work has to belong in community. It is part of community. And it has work beyond, right? It, so if you think art is very particular, um, as, as an artist, I really love Doris Salcedo, it's a Colombian artist. Also. The more specific you are, the more it goes out into the world. It touches more people. 
as we speak your, like, you know, when, when we talk about song lines, when we talk about Oli, when we talk about the things that are so specific to us, then it has a deeper meaning for so many more people because they see themselves in that, right? When I, you know, when we sing to our maunas, when we sing to our, to our why, when we do these things, all of us are made of water, right? But when we become specific, that's when it really moves people to the next place, you know? It is sometimes the songs that you hear in the middle of a protest while the police are coming down on you, while you think you have nowhere left to turn. It's in those songs, it's in that work, it's in that visual, it's in that touchstone of art that keeps you going. And in that sense, it's more, it's not really art. It's the need for all of the languages that, and all of the things, like the dance, the song, the visual, that's all of the language that we need to survive, to win. And we don't talk about winning, right? We do, we talk about win, like this win, that win, but how do you get through a revolutionary change? How do you keep it going? You have to have art and culture. You have to have it. You take art out of a movement, you have very little. It's dry, uh, becomes quite Western. You stop it around, you know, things. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> right? It's somehow you somehow lose something. Um, but I don't know if Melanie uh, wanted to speak a little bit more to that. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Sorry, sorry, Karen, I'm not. I think that's, uh, Probably two things, and one is that everything that Joy just spoke about, how art should influence, you know, or art should be influenced by activism, vice versa. You can say that about, I'd say that about the academy, mm -hmm. that the academy academic work should be for the benefit of activists. And I think if, you know, and vice versa, that relationship, the activists inform, informing academics and academics informing activists. Otherwise, how are we practicing our sovereignty in places like this. Mm. Um, so that's one thing. But I just, you know, black followers, sorry, I'm just going to say we are the greatest artists <laughs> on the planet. <laughs> um, and, I, and I heard that, you know, heard recently we're talking about art because it really is something that is so ingrained in who we are as black followers and people who belong to this continent. Um, I heard it described recently as it's our intellectual expression. And I think that um, the way that art, I'm not an artist, but I, you know, work, I do a lot of work with artists and stuff as well, but I think that um, you know, art has to be part of all of these discussions um, and having artists with us all the time because their way of understanding the world is so important and it really needs to inform everything that we do, particularly you know, people who work in the academy. So I just said. Thank you. Thank you. So, next question. Thank you. Back of the room. I might need the microphone. Yes, no problem. It's coming to you. Thanks so much. Hi, thank you. Um, I just also thank you for the shout out to my tomorrow people, Joy. <laughs> and I could feel um, some of our our shared struggles and I shed some tears. So thank you. It's always good to have tears at conferences, right? Um, okay, so my question is this. Um, we're talking a lot about art, but I'd like to have you speak more specifically to the role of spirituality in resistance and the practices of the spiritual and the political, and how that plays into the relations that we're building as um, citizens of a sovereign Blue Pacific Oceanic Nation, Sanamasi. Mm. Come on. Do you want to say anything? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, in terms of, yeah. Within that space, one thing is we, 
in my practice is conscious of uh, what is appropriate or can be being blessed and to do outside of sacred. And in reverence, so in spirituality, in the, in the way I'm, I understand and the practice that comes with it is knowing the reverence or the sacred uh, practice of that. And that comes with, with the spirituality of the understanding of that. So there'll be some songs that are sung only in the space where you come in and the protocols and in that ritual space. You cannot do that outside. So in the case of my upbringing in Wewak, um, Sipik, the Sakisin, um, the practice, some of the sacred practice cannot be taken out of that. Um, the other brother, um, I will like in Draman, yeah, we went, but it's only, we can only be there, experience it, and in that space and coming out, cannot use it anywhere. That's the spirituality of paying respect or rev in reverence to those practice. And that is important um, that we continue to do that. Um, some of the Manus drumming as well, uh, that is also only played if um, Ivory Leke is playing because he was given the blessing to play. So if we travel with him and play in concerts or festival, unless Ivory is there, we cannot play any of those drum beats. Cannot. And so that, is, that in itself is what we pay respect to and, and understanding that as well. Um, coming out of that, in terms of where the art falls and the movement itself, um, black activism, I don't know if anyone has heard or it's coming, imagine now where uh, indigenous artists coming together. So here in Australia from West Papua, and we're building that through the music scene. So, and also occupying some of the theater spaces. And so, Melbourne Art Centre, um, Sydney Opera House, and we're aiming to bring it here to Canberra Arts Theatre. Uh, but also it's about the messages in the, in the songs, which talks about the struggle, and as I said here, yeah, the struggle is in those songs and in those uh, messages, and really highlighting that as well. And even with the Pacific's concept, um, which slowly we're building that as well. Um, and bringing the artists from the region to come and uh, perform here in the, and also in collaboration and uh, with the First Nation artists. So last month, um, it, yeah, uh, with the, the Pacific concert just in Melbourne at the uh, Maya Music Bowl. And this will continue. And this is the, one of the aim that we will continue to build is uh, bringing the artists together like Monday and send, spreading the same message where we see this gap or needs to highlight the social justice issues that right across in the region. And when we look at the policy makers where they use those narrative around people to people connection to the region and challenging that within the music space and making sure that some of those funds that goes towards um, just for a PR exercise is invested into those who practice those um, the arts and really shifting uh, the narrative and understanding that yes, it has to come from the grassroots, uh, those who are the advocates of those, um, uh, yeah, whether it's the social justice issues or um, the protectors of those arts and culture. Mm -hmm. Wait, I do have one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I did have one thing I wanted to add. Um, when we were on Omicam, every day in the circ uh, in, in blocking that road, in holding that road, there was ceremony three times a day on that moment by the elders, by folks who, and we did hula every day. And one of the most intimidating things for the state of Hawaii, particularly when we came back and we did you had like 400 people inside the capital, Tundra, all doing the same hula, all doing the same dances and songs. 
where the ground is vibrating. That is what they were threatened by. It wasn't the blockade. It wasn't us protesting. It was us protesting in our language, in our bodies, in our protocols, and every person that came out to give, to give, um, to give gifts and to, 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 you know, they were coming, people were coming from all over the world. We, I mean, have a whole new discussion about that. And then the, but it knew only was created on the spot specifically for that person. From people who are, you know, from very, very skilled practitioners. In La Bawa Kua, which is like in a realm we're not supposed to be kicking it in, really. So the, the consciousness of being very spiritually grounded where we were was vital to our, actually to our existence, because if you weren't about it, you were going to get um, altitude sickness or something. And people were taken off the mountain. We saw people have nervous breakdowns. We had all kinds of things happen because you need to be uh, spiritually grounded, way more than the Kabbalah. You needed to be spiritually centered to be on that moment, to stay and to be present, to resist the state wanting to build something they don't need to build, right? Or to help a corporation build something they don't build. The state wasn't building it, they were just facilitating the police, right? It was the spiritual grounding of us on that mountain that was the most threatening to the state. And there was other art, right? So I just want to say that as a specific example of how these things can work. Yes, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, we've got a question up the back. Gentleman raising your hand. I'm to speak. Oh, thank you. That's fine. Yeah. My name is Bob Connell. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, questions around sovereignty and self determination. They are also a deeply political question. Questions that are, ought to be answered by institutions that are set up as form of state. Institutions that, or the countries that have been decolonized, institutions that have been set up by the colonial powers, and we've subscribed to it, we've, uh, you know, taken as part of our own countries, and, 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 and that, that, that those institutions have become the legitimate institutions of decision making. So my question then is, um, given that those two themes are quite deeply political, and, and I think ultimately all the advocacy, all the campaign has to point towards that institution making some substantive decision on those questions. How does your work uh, impact on those institutions of decision making? And it, from your experience and observation, do you think that going forward, is there a prospect for change, considering the uh, uh, political cultures and forces that have played uh, in the world, in our region, in our countries? Do you think there is a prospect for change in the things that you would like to see? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, look, it's, um, I think the agenda for a nuclear free and independent Pacific remains at the heart of uh, institutional uh, organizations and structures. So I think if you were here listening to Narani Slade, um, he spoke about the emergence of some of our regional institutions. They came out of this recognition of the context which independent states were emerging, but we were still wholly captured by um, colonial powers. 
to the, the formation of the Pacific Islands Forum itself was a breakaway from the Pacific community, as we know it today, where France, the UK in particular, were quite instructed in terms of regional and regional architecture. So the breakaway, is, it, it still carried that because of precisely when we talk about sovereignty, it cannot be in absence of the small, the people. It, it, this is not just about the state and state government project. It emerges from the people. And I think that we should not forget that. that I think we're at a place where our regional institutions need to be reminded again. I mean, bringing West Papua back onto the regional agenda was, is still so problematic because of the construction of the forum today. And it's going to be even more difficult now that we've got the US envoy, we have China envoy, we have the Europeans sending envoys into our regional institution. Our governments and sovereign Pacific Island governments have got to resolve this long and enduring question of territories in our region. It is highly political. The government of Papua New Guinea is in a very different position to the government of Fiji, for example, because of the border with Indonesia. But we still need to create the space, and perhaps that's another question, where Pacific study needs to come in, both to resource the politics that our countries need to do. These are not easy questions that our governments need to do. In terms of Mahi Nui, we know that we've lost at least, I would say, maybe two decades. And I think the neoliberal era has been instructive to make us become more and more about self, about me, and what I need within regional construct. And we, today, when you look at our region, we are persuaded by my need. The idea of regional goods, regional solidarity, it simply doesn't exist because there's no space to talk about in these kinds of instructive ways that can support our countries and our country. I, am, I, I really respect that a lot of our countries are going through really difficult questions right now that are forced by, but I would not want to separate the big S from the small S and the work that our people are tirelessly doing to give language and answers to the state. Because I think they need to grapple with this. They need to wrestle with this question. And we need to move towards resolution. We cannot constantly hide. We cannot give uh, institutions an out just because it's politically difficult. We recognize and respect them. But this is not an out we need. And we need to demand more. But we can see all our countries are simply interested in their national issues. And we are driving that much. So for civil society, we ran to bring us on board, but it's falling off the regional agenda. Hawaii, where are you? We just consider them the US by construct of our regional architecture. But it is messy. And I think we need to work on two levels. Institutional arrangement, sure, that's mom, that's government. But we need to re-solidify this one. Because if we don't do that, don't expect our institutions to be able to. They are under tremendous pressure. I mean, you, you know this. If you just take a look at our wharfs, our ports, and you just take a look at the at flights coming in, private jets don't matter. The players have come in consistently and are deeply embedded in our 
regional institutions, they're part of the place. And they're not about to allow us to practice. It's, we have seeded that notion. But I really respect that our political leaders right now, they're in a tough place, and they should be. But we need them to step up on the question of self-determination and sovereignty. In the context of territories, this is our business. This is our country's business. Sovereign countries, this is their business. But we need to complete that work. Um, but yeah, I'm, I am very aware, I'm very aware of how much our countries are courted and how much political agency and capital they have to support struggles in the course. Thank you so much. And, and it's very relevant, I, I will I'll acknowledge, um, it's very relevant to us here too. And, and this is why um, I always keep on asking myself, as well as you, Mel, why are we not more active as Indigenous peoples and the Pacific nations together? I think there's so much that we can actually really, you know, come forward with actions and a lot of the conversation we've talked about here. And, and we're also close to each other. This is the issue that we should be uh, really sharing and supporting. Um, so that's one really uh, huge issue um, that's been concerning me, but thank you for that because it makes so much more sense and I'm sure it does to everybody here today. Thank you for your question, yes? Um, thank you, panel. Uh, my name is Kaita Sen um, and I work at one of these regional institutions, the Pacific Community. Um, I just, firstly, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the sharing that you all brought uh, this morning. Um, for me, certainly it's helped me refine my understanding of uh, sovereignty and I had a, a brief conversation with Melinda yesterday um, around that as well. So uh, I'm hoping that some of this thinking I can take it back um, because uh, there is a lot of yeah, movement as I see from, from, from my perspective. Um, so I guess what struck me with uh, Mr. Kama's question as well was around, uh, and what you said, Maureen, around um, like our, our institutions at the regional level. And I understand that there's something called like a regional uh, architecture review coming up in the pipeline. Uh, so this is something I hear from inside the institution, but I don't hear any details. I think it's a matter of uh, sovereignty. Um, and so I think it's a bit of a shame that I have to come to Canberra to ask this type of question when I can't um, ask my boss directly. Uh, but I think, again, it's a, it's a reflection of um, the small S and the big S game, well, uh, two parts of the same puzzle. Um, so grateful if you might be able to shed some light on, um, I guess, how as a collective and thinking about the notions of indigenous sovereignty that have come up, not only today, but over the past couple of days, with something as uh, influential as a regional architecture review, um, how can we combine, I guess, the uh, small S and large S activities uh, to kind of influence um, what our architecture looks like um, as well? And I'm happy to take this conversation further. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for doing it. Thank you. You'd like to answer that? Yes. The big questions every day. Yes. Perhaps I'll, I'll try. Well, they all argue about where. <laughs> <laughs> Stop arguing amongst ourselves. Um, the process for engagement with regional institutions is um, it's really convoluted. It, it's, it, it drives me batty. That's just. And in part because this is narrative about inclusion, right? Ownership, um, process oriented. You want to hear from the people, right? But I think some of our regional institutions have struggled because of the political nature of some of these conversations. 
And so the, the, the discussions around uh, regional architecture, I mean, what is a suitable regional architecture uh, for a region at this precise point in time, is like security, one of those things that they don't want to consult with. Um, and so we are wholly dependent on governments. So it depends on the government. If they want to facilitate it, they will facilitate it through what we call informal, informal processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you see? So, I'm, and then we get to the informal, informal process, and it, it is ridiculous, the, the, the construct of informal, informal. To which then we say, look, why don't we just take it to an informal, informal, informal? <laughs> and then we just say, look, let's just kick it totally out and just have a grog session <laughs> and get on with it. But the, 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 this control, over what we can openly say is problematic. It is considered uh, uh, totally radical or unhelpful or why are you so depressive and gloomy and or, or just, no. So it, it, it really kills any ability and that's why we have to come to Canberra <laughs> to be able to. And I want to say the value of construction of space and I think this is very important for AAPS to consider, academia and Pacific Island studies to consider the construction of space for difficult conversation is premium at this point in time. And it needs to take place outside of the kinds of uh, regional institutional construction of space. It goes nowhere. They send us 50-page documents, 100-page, or maybe 300-page document, an hour before the meeting, where they want you to say something that is impactful or intelligent. <coughs> and I'm just constantly going, no more. I can't. Impossible. But I think that's my, my, my real advice, is that we have to construct spaces outside to look at highly political, contentious issues and maybe academia can facilitate that, and Pacific Island Station. And I can see, and, and I'm well aware, as someone who's been blacklisted many times, a space like ANU, I am well aware of what that means. But I want to challenge you. The creation of space is highly, highly premium at this point in time for us to get through complex issues outside of technical, bureaucratic spaces. So my advice to the crop is facilitate some more, pay for some more of these convenings that is willing to be political in its truest sense. I, I, you know, I, when, I, when I think about, there's so many um, countries that are left out of regional formations. Or not, let me not say countries. The people that it matters to. The Kanaka Maori, Samoans, right? American Samoan, right? A lot of spaces where regionally we're at that, the people that would show up to the conversation are not the people that we want to show up to the conversation. And of course we lock them out. But does that mean they don't have any influence over your formations? Or does that? So what are the ways, I think, that when you work in a regional institution, how do you push that institution? How do you pull that? How do you flip that to be like, who's not here? Is there a way we can figure out a way for some of these other nations to be here who have been locked out? Because if you're not upsetting somebody where you work, <laughs> <laughs> because that formation is not, if that formation isn't upsetting somebody in the region and in the world, then how much fun is your job, though? <laughs> you know? I'm not saying to break yourself, but you must speak 
right? We do need to create these, in, these informal, formal, whatever spaces. We do need to do that because we need things outside of the institutions. But we also need to like yell at our boss sometimes. We don't do things in fear, fear of losing, fear of being disrespected, being called a pasital, we have a mala or whatever we're told. We don't have the place, we're embarrassing. But how do you think the world shifted? How do you think we got anything? Because we pissed somebody off in some regional formation somewhere, right? So be willing to risk. That's what I'm going to say. Be willing to risk for the sake of that small s in the big s. Because there is no big s without that small s. There really isn't. We want our countries on our terms, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot working against that, right? I am the World Bank, all of our little friends, right? Corporations. We have to upset it. We have to unsettle it. You will get another job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, violence isn't always the answer. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, you're coming from. Oh, yeah, I've been to many code of conduct training in the last uh, two years for upsetting people, but um, that's the price you pay. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, this, this uh, big S and little S. And I think uh, in this in this place in Australia, I think uh, just from my own observations, just watching where we are at this stage, you know, kind of 250 years in uh, of um, Australia, I can I see that the big S wants to be the little S. Um, I think that the state of Australia, the the, the this colony, because I keep reminding people that this is what it is, um, is wanting to, is, is doing things, using language and doing things that kind of assumes our indigenous status. So they're using that, you know, in ways that they're just framing things. So even politicians now just using things like we are part of this, you know, 70,000, 60,000, 70,000 year old society, you know, culture. And it just blows my mind that the people who came here and invaded our land now expect to be, have just, you know, said, we are part of you. And so it's these, you know, these things that they use to constantly try and um, erase us, but in, now they're doing it in a way that they want to assume indigeneity. And so I just think that like, just in terms of, of where, where things are in Australia, there's, 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 been, there's been this shift towards trying to be more Indigenous. Um, you know, and I'm talking about settlers trying to be more Indigenous while at the same time doing things, you know, kind of co-opting, uh, uh, appropriating Indigenous ways of being and to actually do harm. And we talked about this, Kim and I were talking about this last night about uh, self-determination and how that is used now as a way of, you know, kind of co-design policies. So then instead of the state enacting um, the removal of children, it is now black fellows that do that because that's a self-determination, you know, policy, determined policy. And in the state of Queensland where I live, and if you're not familiar with Australian jurisdiction, I would, I, I couldn't equate Queensland to Texas, if you think about it, you know, right? So uh, others are saying that it's Alabama or Mississippi, but I think the further north we go, right, the further north we go, the red the next, but um, anyway, it's something to do with the equator, I think. You know? That's what happens. Um, but, you know, so I couldn't search for Queensland, so it's not as bad, but... but um, so, so in the state of Queensland, that we see this treaty process happening, 
which isn't what it sounds like. It's not a negotiation about this relationship between the state and Indigenous people. It is now just a new way of framing uh, service delivery of welfare. Mm. So, you know, these are the things where the state actually, and, and the country, the nation, wants to, you know, use these things that our own aspirations, our own, you know, things that our own processes for governance to actually just do the things um, to remove our children, to constantly keep us in the state that they want us in. Um, it's just a new kind of ways of failing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, instead of actually addressing the inherent racism that kills us. Thanks. Just final remarks for me is organizing, which goes back to the uh, sister Jerry's um, uh, message earlier. Um, within the arts itself, here in Australia, I see that there is slowly that shift as well in terms of arts institution in Australia are now kind of like opening those spaces. Uh, but when it comes to West Papua, in the last 10 years, to enter into those spaces was very limited because of the word West Papua or just your name and then that's it. But being strategic about it and reframing as well, those same tactics, but reframing it in a way that it's in our terms and conditions. Um, it's open spaces where we can now enter those spaces. And this is one thing that I see perhaps within the regional architecture where MACFEST, Northern Nation Festival of Arts, or the Pacific Festival of Arts, is still way behind, and there hasn't been any spaces to really open up within that. Um, we've tried, as artists, try to enter into those spaces within that festival, but we got knocked back. Um, the Melanation Nation Festival is the Solomons. Just because of the name of the band, they just, yeah, sorry. And breakfast in Guam. But I'm interested because of like the, in Hawaii. So that's something, a conversation that I'm really keen to really explore. And those who are in this space that can, yeah, yeah. That's, that's something I just want to yeah, put it out there to mobilize, organize, and yeah. occupy. Yes. 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 I, I, I did, and I and now I have to be the person who says we have to wrap up soon as well, because um, we're going to try to keep on um, keep on time today. Western construct that is driving everything. But before that, though, I wanted to say, as someone um, who I feel like comes from a who makes space, tries to constantly create spaces to have these kinds of conversations and who comes from a family of women who also make these spaces. I've been thinking a lot about the big S and the little S and coming from no S being Barnabin, who is literally falling through the cracks. I'm thinking of Bow's questions, regional architecture. There's no space for a Barnabin within that. We are in the too hard basket for Pitagas, for Fiji, definitely for Australia, for New Zealand, for the UK. They're just like, that's the island we are going to forget. And if Kiribati doesn't speak up for Banaba, no one's speaking up for Banaba. If Fiji doesn't speak up for Banaba, no one's speaking up for Banaba. So there are these groups like ours who absolutely fall through all the cracks and we're connected to literally every island and every continent that you all represent because our island fed the whole world, right? Through global agriculture. So I've been waiting for a long time to actually say that within this space that all of us created to have these other conversations. And that is why Project Banapa, for example, is in everyone's conference bags. It's not just another art exhibition and another you know, opportunity to send research out into the world. It's a critical example of what happens when you ignore certain tiny little 
six square kilometers spaces and everyone eats the island where our ancestors have been buried for 2,000 years. Anyway, of course I'm supposed to be about that, but the point being when we're talking about sovereignty, big S and little s, when we're talking about regional architecture, when we're talking about institutions, when we're talking about governments and governance and all of this stuff, and when we're talking about our future with respect to climate change and environmental degradation and organizing, it is absolutely useful to think about those groups that have absolutely fallen through the cracks and have no construct whatsoever around it. And when we try to talk to lawyers and others, it's like, eek, that one. Uh, no one's been able to solve that one for decades. We took the British government to its own court over this. So it's, it's one of those amazing examples. It's an island with no food and no water and no land. If you think through Barnaba, you can think through so many of the different issues that are going on in Oceania right now. And you can imagine a future where you have an island with no food and no water and no place for birds to nest. So that's why I snuck Project Barnaba into everyone's conference bags. It doesn't matter if I'm doing it or Yuki's doing it or whoever's doing it. This is an important story. This island is an important story. And I think kind of brings all of our discussions about how we're connected to each other as well. People in Australia ate Barnaba, they ate Nauru too, same in Aotearoa, New Zealand. They consumed it. The land went to Hawaii, to Tokyo, to Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. That's where the island went. So when we're thinking through these things, let's think about it through, at a very material basis. You're talking about ownership of microscopic things. We're talking about particles of land. When we're thinking about building new islands and floating them while everything else is sinking, think about where sand and soil is going to come from. You don't just cut and paste somebody else's land and go and rebuild your island. They're shipping sand into Hawaii all the time for Waikiki. Let's not cut and paste everyone's land everywhere. Let's stop that. So there's all these profound organic ways that we're already connected to each other and we have to build on those kinships. These are not theoretical kinships. These are about ancestors. And this is about the future as well. Thanks so much, Katarina. You can see by the response that everyone's behind you. So there's solidarity here. Your question, just a short question. Yeah, just, just a very short to... uh, oh. okay. yeah, Another aspect to these issues concerns the, the boundaries of the existing states in the region, which to a large extent are the products of colonial line drawing. And of course then, those new constructs that are put together largely by the colonial governments become the proud bearers of independence, sovereignty. But many of the parts within those countries question that. And it's very hard for the region to manage those issues. Look at Bougainville. Uh, the region's not been able to discuss really Bougainville, the forum doesn't discuss Bougainville because it threatens Papua New Guinea to discuss Bougainville. When Bougainville got an agreement from Papua New Guinea for a, an independence referendum, PNB insisted that it be described as a separate independence because they insisted that Bougainville had already become independent as part of Papua New Guinea. So I think the region needs to be thinking a lot about the validity of the existing boundaries inherited from the colonial authorities and about how people get self-determination either within the existing states or by having processes that enable the creation of different ones. Because states are still quite important in the eyes of people who are seeking sovereignty. Thank you, Big Question. Is there any response? Uh, um, many of us to Kati, and I really want 
to just acknowledge and again state the enduring legacies. And the agenda is big. And I think that part of the uh, loss of two decades also meant that we lost touch with a lot of these issues that at the regional level we hold but we need that reminder consistently because uh, these questions are all entangled. And I think bringing Barma squarely back um, is significantly important. I think we've rallied around key issues at the regional level, as Papua, uh, Tong, um, look, we really took some support work across to uh, Ohinui, Kanaki, but I think it should be A, acknowledged, and secondly, more than that, simply to state that that is something, another agenda that we will take forward, that we simply cannot drop. Um, and I know the entanglement, particularly with Fiji, there is possibilities to open up windows for at least some of those discussions um, to take place. Um, so I think that that's some commitment that we can make and openly and publicly to state it. Um, you know, people look at Nauru today very similar. And I see the attacks on Nauru. Uh, and I'm reminded again about complicity, uh, which brings me to, to the question of Ubu and the kinds of burdens, the ongoing burdens that we put on our countries. Right? It's really complicit of Australia and New Zealand and Canada, the countries that were engaged in voting. This idea that the burden should only be borne by the government of Papua New Guinea and Pacific Island countries, that's irresponsible. There's a complicity that sits, that should be squarely put back on the Papua and let's not kid ourselves about these kinds of blurred lines and really making this just a public union. Sure, it is. But we are complicit when we don't recognize these other players who sit silently. What are they doing? What is Australia's role in the context of opening? What is its role? Should it have a role? and to the burden purely on the state of our meeting. Because I think that that's this complicity that we think, and I, I'm constantly challenged when we talk about the amount of expectations we put on our own leaders to resolve, and in that way, give a pass to those who should be wholly responsible. They are the ones we need to. And in saying that, it's also to really labor the need for the New Zealand government, Aotearoa government, to come to the party. Because their silence is complicit in regional agendas also. It is absolutely complicit. And I want to say that because we constantly expect Pacific governments to do the right thing, to be, and they are. But in doing that, we give pulse to those that are implicated in the big sovereign questions. They are implicated by the design of these countries. So really to say that when we think about burdens of responsibilities, who should bear them and carry them, we should also implicate the original architects of how our nations were constructed in this discussion and make them responsible. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Could you please thank again all of these wonderful speakers?